Psychness. I believe we've terribly, terribly, terribly misinterpreted it. That song falls short. As glorious as it is, and it is, falls short. I don't ever hear anybody talking about what Christ-likeness is from a practical standpoint, only from a mystical standpoint, yeah. inner relationship, yeah. fruit of the Spirit, this kind of thing. But from a practical standpoint, the man who, whose line in the Bible originated that song, Philippians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul, spent his lone life traipsing all the way to the farthest reaches of the known civilized world of his day, letting blood about every third day, and it was his own. Somebody else treating him viciously and violently. And when he came down toward the end, he said, It is my desire that I may know him, the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death. And he was dragged almost everywhere he went by the Holy Spirit or somebody else saying, I die every day. Yeah. I want to know if we really mean it when we say, I want to be like Christ. <coughs> the most Christ-like thing you will ever do in this life is to build other human beings to the point of world impact. Yeah. Amen. But I don't ever hear anybody talking about this. Why? Because tradition has interpreted for us and given us a track that we run on. And I gravely fear as important as that tradition is and as wonderful as what it says, it falls short of a practical definition of Christ's likeness. Did you know that when Charlie Chaplin, the famed comedian, was alive, they had a Charlie Chaplin look-alike contest over in Monaco. He boarded a ship and went over and anonymously entered that contest and came in third. <laughs> if Jesus were to enter a look-alike, a Christ-like look-alike contest in today's church, he'd come in somewhere beside first. That's right. And we would be horrified, indeed we will be in some likelihood when it's all over, to see how we missed it. Jesus could say of us, as well as all those church attenders who are in church more often than we are handling the Bible every day more seriously than we do, the Pharisees, and when it was over, or He looked them in the face early, and He said, your traditions absolutely negate the power of God. Yeah. Um, I'm going to borrow a crazy verse and tell you a crazy story. I copied this down out of my Amplified Bible, and so I do have something of a suggestive precedent for this, and if you, in fact, if this weren't on tape and you quoted me, I'd call you a liar, but I can't get rid of it. It's going to be on tape. It's like the last judgment. It comes back to face you every time you turn around. 2 Corinthians 11, 1. Don't turn to it. Just listen. This is the Amplified Bible. Paul said, I wish you would bear with me while I indulge in a little foolishness. <laughs> Indeed, do bear with me. He said. <laughs> this mother was trying to teach her little boy, a tiny little boy, manners. And I'm going to quote what the mother said. She said, Son, when we're among people not in the home, we don't want to use words that might be misunderstood. We don't want to say TT. -t. <laughs> said, if you need to use the bathroom, you say to me, I need to whisper. <laughs> and I'll understand. And I'll get you to the bathroom. Well, just a short time later, the Christmas holidays came, and they were visiting the little lad's grandparents. He was up in his granddaddy's lap and nature called, collect. <laughs> and he suddenly went rigid and he said, Grandpa, I need to whisper. And 
his granddaddy said, son, get up here and whisper in my ear. <laughs> and he did. And when it was over, his granddaddy said, son, I'm sure glad you didn't need to shout. <laughs> for that too. The first man is of the earth earthy. <laughs> and that fits. But you know what? Wonderful as what's been happening here, all in the world we're doing is listening to the mildest whispers of God. In fact, that's all we're going to get in this age. Earthquake? No. Fire? No. Mighty sound of mighty rushing wind? No. But then came a still small voice. Yeah. And be sure with all the noise, the great swell of this music, absolutely heavenly marvelous. It, it's just been marvelous. I mean, those are rafter, ringer, roof-raising songs. Marvelous, marvelous. Don't they aid you to worship? Amen. And then the great preaching, great preaching. Uh, just one after another great messages and I'll frankly tell you we've got a real stewardship problem on our hands now we're house managers to be economizers of what we've heard and the problem is we no sooner hear one than we hear a next one yeah. mm -hmm. and you can't catch up with the one before you're on the way to the next one unless you deliberately take away to retain that first one You'll answer for something you will have long since forgotten when you stand before God. In fact, you forget it in the next message. Be careful. Be careful. I've got as careful notes as I know how to, and I'm going to get most of these tapes, and I want to listen to them again and again, and I'll hear things I didn't hear the first time, I'm yeah. sure, but be careful. Be careful. Be careful. Jesus talked more about hearing than anything else He ever talked about. That you hear, how you hear, what you hear. And he talked about it over and over again. Be careful, be careful, be careful. Any one of these men has drowned us in great truths of which we are stewards, managers, economists before God. God help us to understand. Brother Paul made a statement in his message this morning that was a catalyst in my mind. He said, and I'll just quote him roughly, but it's essentially accurate. He said, as I move all over this country and go into churches, I am very grieved everywhere I go over the shallowness of the people of God. I had the privilege of sitting at lunch with Major Ian Thomas some years ago, and at the end of the, well, we were together about two and a half hours in just personal conversation. And at the end of the time, I said, Major, tell me what you feel about Southern Baptists. And he smiled rather wryly and plied me with a question, which I don't need to tell you, and I answered him just as wryly. And he said, then I must tell you in a word, shallow. Shallow. I want you to turn in your Bible tonight to the book of Hebrews, chapter 5. The book of Hebrews, chapter 5. And I hardly know how to handle this text. It's so massive. We're just going to traffic the truth of it a few minutes. I'm going to teach. Actually, I'm the guy, I'm the light hitter who lays down the sacrificial bunt, the, the sacrifice bunt to get the base runners in scoring position for the slugger who's coming up. And I really mean that earnestly. That's true. I've heard this testimony. I know this man. I know Dixon Ryle. Boy, I mean, when, I, when I thought about that, when you and I were talking the other day, that is absolutely incredible what has happened as a result of the things that were set in motion there. You're going to hear it tonight, and I don't want to get in the way in any way. I would actually defer this time and let Brother Walter have it happily. It's that good and that important. Amen. But I'm the bunter to get the, the runners in scoring position. So let's lay down the sacrificial, the sacrifice bunt, and move the runners up to second and third. Sure get out of the way. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I'm a good bunter. Yes. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 5, verse 11. Now, you'll notice we're breaking into a reading 
It doesn't start here. You can tell that by of whom we have many things to say. Well, the whom there is Melchizedek. Now, if you want to know an example of meat as it's referred to here, it's the high priesthood after the order of Melchizedek. If you know what that means and can handle it, then you're pretty good at at least tackling meat. If you don't know what that means, God help you. You're either lost or a baby. You see, living things are expected to grow. Amen. But dead things can't. Now if you are not growing, you'd better start with the first possibility that you're not alive. You have never been born of the Spirit of God. And thus you cannot grow. You can't even be expected to be. You need to start at square one. You need to beg God for mercy and let Jesus save you upon the cue of the Holy Spirit who work freely in a place like this toward you. So we're talking about something very important. Verse 11 says, Of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, in other words, we can't say these many things to you. And here's the reason. Seeing you are... Now let me tell you what the tense of that verb actually is. It literally says, Seeing you have become... Ah, so it's an acquired deficiency. It's not something that's natural for their stage where they should be. They have deteriorated into this. How? Well, probably by being pew potatoes. Listening to truth all the time without ever appreciating, appropriating, and applying. He says, seeing you have become dull, and that word has major emphasis. It's the same word that it across the chapter division in chapter 6, verse 12, is translated slothful. It means lazy or, or, or sluggish of hearing. Let me read it again. We have many things to say to you about Melchizedek and hard to say them for this reason, because you have become sluggish of hearing. <coughs> for when for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need instead that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, or the beginning ideas of the outspeakings of God. And you have become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness. For he is a baby. And that word babe or baby is major emphasis. It's God's sense of horror. It's the Holy Spirit's shout at you. Yet this is something you should never be. But look at you. For he is a baby. Oh, beg your pardon. Did I say never? Did you catch my error? Certainly you ought to be a baby. You can't be born without becoming something. You become a baby. I said never. No, you ought never at this stage to be a baby. That's what he's saying here. For he is a baby. But strong meat belongs to them that are of full age. Major emphasis. Full age. Now that's what God's after. So if you don't mind marking in your Bible, draw a circle around the two words full age. That's what he wants out of every one of his children. Strong meat belongs to them that are of full age. Even those who by reason of use have their senses. Are you catching the dimensions of this? Their senses exercised to discern or to decide between both good and evil. Now let me give you a few clues. See the word senses there? That's not talking about the five senses of your body. It's talking about the correspondent senses in your spirit. In other words, your spirit has sight just like your body does. It has hearing or ears just like your body does. It has a sense of smell just like your body does. It has a sense of taste just like your body does. It has a sense of touch just like your body does. So you see... God gave you five natural senses and then He added a sixth sense in your spirit called faith to keep those five senses from making fools of you. Yeah. 
Yeah. And then He gave you five counterpart senses in your spirit, and each one of them has a massive role to play, just like your physical senses have massive roles to play, one by one up to the five of them, in determining the outcome of your life in this world. And you cannot learn anything materially, biologically, psychologically without the use of your senses. You simply cannot do it. And you cannot develop spiritually without the exercised use of your senses in your spirit. That's right, so the Bible says, taste and see that the Lord is good yes. and blessed are those that lay hold of Him. And one by one, he who hears, let him hear that his soul may live. See, one by one, those senses are spelled out, transferred to the Spirit. Now, here's what this says. If you do not, by reason of use, build the muscles of those senses just like you have developed the senses of your body, then you are going to be stunted in growth if you are alive at all. So how well are you doing? Now, let me tell you something else. See, the word exercise there who by reason of use have their senses exercised. You know what that word is? It is the Greek word for gymnasium. For an athletic facility. A place where games are conducted. A gymnasium. Here's what that means. Your senses are to be worked out just like an Olympic bodybuilder works out the muscles of his body. <coughs> Your spiritual senses are to be exercised just as certainly as the wildest, most fanatical person exercising the muscles of his body to build his body strongly. Your spiritual senses would be exercised just like that. For what purpose? To discern both good and evil. Do you know that a baby will put anything in his mouth? Right. How many pastors say to us, my people, my people, I don't understand that they can be taken in by anything. They watch the craziest things. They fall before it in an instant. They turn these things over television. I had one pastor. They actually chartered a bus, and he didn't even know it till they were gone to go to a Benny Hinn conference in Dallas. They'll put anything in their mouths. When I was a, just a tiny boy, my, my sister was 15 months older than I, 15 months older than I, and one day, she, she was playing with some house keys. She put them in her mouth just like a child would do. And before we knew it, they were down lodged in her throat. And, and before we knew it after that, she was turning blue. I mean blue, dark blue. She was dying. She was suffocating. My mother was pounding on her, screaming. And I, everybody was in panic. My mother was just doing everything she could. She tried to reach her finger down her throat, couldn't get it out. My grandmother heard all the noise and all the screaming and came in and my sister had actually turned blue. My grandmother came rushing in and somebody screamed what had happened. She just simply took her by the heels, picked her up, shook her one time and that key came right down on the floor. A baby, a child will put anything in its mouth. I was pastor of a church right across the street from the house where three times I had to go to the hospital with the family because the children had put peas and things like that in their ears and up their noses. <laughs> now do you understand what I'm saying? Even those who by reason of use have their inward spiritual senses exercised to discern or to decide between good and evil. So they'll know the difference know how to take the good and how to reject the evil. Now let's go across the chapter division. Here's one of those places where it's a shame there's a chapter division. You see that there shouldn't be by the word therefore. Did you know your Bible was divided into chapters and verses 1500 years after it was completed yeah. by a man on horseback. <laughs> These are not inspired divisions. You must have had a heavy job with the horse as he hit this one. Because the word therefore shows it's a connecting coupling link between the last, at least the last verses of chapter 5 and the opening verses of chapter 6. Now listen carefully. Therefore, here's what we should do. Stay elated in our growth. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on under perfection. And that word perfection is major emphasis. I'm not reducing it when I tell you that is God's goal, but the word means maturity. 
God's goal is perfection, but this word means maturity. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works, or of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms, and of laying on of hands, and of resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. And this will we do if God permit. That'll be far enough. Some of you are hoping I'll get into that next one. I wouldn't touch it. Not tonight. There's <laughs> a great British Christian woman who came to the States on a 30-day tour. Well, she was here about 40 days, but she, she spoke in churches several times a day normally for 30 days during that tour all over the United States, beginning the East Coast all the way to the West Coast and various stops in between. She came back to Kennedy Airfield ready to take off back to Britain and a, a reporter from Christianity Today News magazine was on hand, began to ask her some questions about her tour. And one of those questions was this. What do you think of American churches? And she smiled and said, if I'm to be honest, I must tell you, they're not churches. They're nurseries. Now either she was right or not. If we're wise, we'll choose against ourselves, believe she is, and act accordingly. If we duck, we're justifying ourselves and thus take our hands, our case out of God's hands. He can't justify somebody who's justifying himself. He just can't do it. Nurseries. Teacher, Sunday school teacher asked a little girl, Ask the whole class, who made you? Little girl answered, God made part, and I made part. <laughs> Teacher said, Really? How did you do that? Little girl answered, God made me real little, and I just growed the rest of the way by myself. <laughs> well, now, you understand how poor an illustration that is. But it's also a good one. It's poor from the standpoint of the sovereignty of God, but it's excellent from the standpoint of the responsibility of man. So if we're wise, right here tonight, every last one of us beginning in this draining spot right now will say to God, I realize how responsible I am to grow. When Peter closed his last letter, he put a command of God out in front of us, but grow in grace, and that is an imperative mood verb, a command, that means it has equal force from God to any one of the Ten Commandments, which means if you're not presently growing, you are now in known sin. You may not have known it when you moved in this room, but you know it now. If you are not presently growing and you are born again, you are in now known sin, and that commandment has equal force to any one of the Ten Commandments, and you are responsible to God, that's an active voice verb. It means God won't do it for you. It's in your court. <clears throat> so you're gonna, you've got to grow yourself a long portion of the way. In other words, you implicate yourself in cooperating with God in the process yeah. of growth. Now, what is God's biggest problem on earth? It's the spiritually immature Christian. God doesn't have any problem with lost people. Most lost people are lost because they've never been around a spirit-controlled Christian. And God doesn't have any trouble with lost people. He's done everything necessary to save them. Jesus died, was buried, risen again, gone to heaven, installed our humanity at God's right hand. Everything necessary to be done has been done on God's side to save a man. But from the standpoint of responsibility, most lost people are lost because they've never been around the spirit-filled Christian. Jesus doesn't shine through. So, God's problem, the spiritually immature person. Let me give you a few outline points. If you're taking notes, if you're a Pennsylvanian. <laughs> I don't want you to think first of the symbols that are used here to picture the spiritually immature Christian. The symbols that are used. I want you to think secondly of the seriousness of the sin of spiritual immaturity. 
I want you to think third of the signs of spiritual immaturity or the symptoms of it, and then last, the solution for it. Now, I don't know whether we'll cover all those or not. I'm not too worried about that. I just want God to register whatever He wants to register. Let's take the first one. The symbols that are used here to picture the spiritual immature Christian. There are three of them. Let me quickly point them out. Number one, the spiritually immature Christian is like a person who has been alive a long time, but he is still a baby who must be continually fed on milk instead of meat. In other words, he's been alive a long time, should be ingesting porterhouse, but instead he is ingesting pablum. Now let me show you that in the text. Last part of verse 12 in chapter 5. You have become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For everyone who uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a baby. There's the first symbol. Let me show you the second one. The spiritual immature person is like a student who has been in school long enough to be doing postgraduate college work but instead, he's still studying repetitively only the ABCs. Now let me show you that. That's a strange picture, isn't it? Let me show it to you. Verse 12, chapter 5. When for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God. You know what that term first principles is? It's the word stoikion. It's actually the term for the first letters in a succession of letters that make up the alphabet. It's the ABCs. That's exactly what that means. So here is a student, and the text plainly says, for the time he's been in school, he ought to be teaching. But instead, he is simply studying and restudying and restudying and restudying and restudying the ABCs as if he can't master them when for the time involved he ought to be doing postgraduate work and he ought to be teaching, but instead he's still studying the ABCs. Now, do you understand how serious God is about this? I mean, that's a crazy picture. Let me show you another one. Here's the third one. The spiritual immature person is like a building contractor who's assigned to build massive, developed skyscrapers, but instead he never builds anything but foundations. And he even does that repetitively in the same place. Look at chapter 6, verse 1. Middle of the verse. Not laying again the foundation. How would you like to live next door? Well, how would you like to live in a home that's next door to an empty lot and your neighbor kept seeing your person owns a lot, keeps coming and saying, I'm going to build there, I'm going to build there, I'm going to build there. And you keep looking for one day, you open the blinds early one morning and there's a crew out there digging a trench and in a little while they're laying cement, concrete, and a foundation is in place. And you say, well, at last he's going to build Two days later you look out there when the concrete is hardened and there's a crew out there with a jackhammer tearing up that foundation. You look out again, a little bit baffled, must have changed his mind about something. He lays another foundation and this process starts and keeps on going on. That's exactly what this says. The spiritually immature person is like a building contractor assigned to build a skyscraper, but instead he never gets past the rebuilding constantly of nothing but foundations. These are the symbols that are used for the spiritually immature Christian. Let me show you the second thing. The seriousness of this problem as far as God is concerned. So serious that when it is prolonged, it becomes a radical sin in God's sight. You see, God is very, very serious about the level of your spiritual maturity. Very, very serious. Because all of God's advertisement on earth comes just like yours does through His body. Amen. He gets strangely silent when He doesn't have any body in a place. Never speaks. 
Or if he did, he'd just go out there and save those. He's the heathen direct. But out there in darkest Africa, he doesn't have anybody, so he's mute. Every, how long has it been since you've been in one of those homes where you walk down a hallway and you saw a whole big frame of little pictures lined up in that frame and you ask about it and it's the birthday pictures of the child in the family. Here's the first birth picture, first year picture, second year picture, third year picture, fourth year picture, fifth year. It goes all the way through, through say, through 25 years of age. If God had an album like that, and he'd made all your pictures. How far would he get? Now be careful. Be careful. God is awfully serious about this. Awfully, awfully serious about it. Now here's the big question. How do you measure your maturity? How do you know how mature you are? Is there any test that you can apply? You bet there is. This text is loaded with three tests, three big ones. Let me give them to you in popular language. Number one, how long have you been saved? How long have you been saved? Listen to this. When for the time you ought to be teachers. How long have you been saved? Here's the way the New, New American Standard Version puts that. By this time, you ought to be teachers. And you know what the word time is? It's not chiron, spiritual opportunity. It's chronos. How long have you been saved? Chronologically. Were you saved in 1942? Then you ought to be as mature as your age and years would cause you to be by steady growth. If you've been saved five years, you ought to be as mature. I get fed up with hearing people say, she's mature for her age. No, she's not. She can't be more mature than her age. Amen. Right. <laughs> she can be a whole lot less mature. That's what they're normally saying. If we say that girl's mature for her age, what we're more normally saying, most other people aren't. Yeah. But she cannot be more mature than her age. Right. That's all the opportunity she's had. Right. How long have you been saved? Some of you people have been saved for 40 years and you have no more clout with God than you did the day before you were saved. Yes. See, God expects every one of His children to be a center of influence, a sphere of magnitude, impacting. And He has a standard to do it by. How long have you been saved? Alright, here's the second test. How much truth have you heard, received, and at what level have you consistently listened to it for all those years since you've been saved? Now listen to it very carefully. Verse 11. I have many things to say to you, he says. They're hard to be uttered, but not because I can't say them. It's because you have sloughed back into laziness of hearing. <coughs> into slothfulness of of hearing. You notice how often God connects hearing with all the processes of the Christian life? Did you know that in those five senses I mentioned a minute ago, there are two original functions? Not smell, not taste, not touch. Those are not original functions. The original functions are looking and listening. Same thing's true in your spirit. The original functions are looking and listening. And as important as looking is, faith comes by hearing. And hearing by the Word of God. Now why have those original functions? Did He pick out listening instead of looking? Let me tell you. When you look at something, a translation process has to take place for it to reach your inner person. When you hear something, it goes direct. No wonder Satan will do anything to distract your looking and distort your listening. Anything. And he is a past master at it. How much truth have you heard and received? And at what level did you listen to it? Listen to verse 14. B part again. By reason of use, you're to have your senses exercised to discern both good and evil. And this is the sense of hearing at this point. Have you become dull of hearing? I was sitting in the 
a kitchen room of our last church. We always had lunch together as a staff every day, as much as possible. And we had a lot of staff brainstorming there. Had staff meeting every day, from 8 to 8.30 in the morning, and we ate lunch together, brainstorming constantly. My custodian was sitting across the table from me one day, and his wife, my secretary, one of my secretaries, was sitting right next to him. And we were just casually talking, and I said, Mary, does Tom ever shout at you? <laughs> does he ever shout at you? Her answer was classic. She said, if he does, my hearing doesn't match his speaking. <laughs> now you think of that. Question. Does your hearing match God's speaking? Mm -hmm. We've been listening, I said, to the whispers of God. Now don't you misunderstand me, the shout's coming. <laughs> you heard it sung about a while ago, the shout's coming. But we're listening to the whispers of God. Does your listening match God's speaking? Be careful, this is where you test your maturity. And I want to tell you frankly, I serve notice and I'm tired of all those people saying, I don't understand you. Why don't you? Amen. Say, you're over my head. Raise your head. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Say, I, don't, I had a guy tell me recently, he didn't tell me, it was repeated to me. He said that, he said he didn't understand one word that man said. Wasn't talking about me, he was talking about himself. He didn't know it. Yeah. I'm not trying to be unkind. Hey. Not at all trying to be unkind. That's you exactly. know what I did? I went and got the tape and counted the times I used the word T H E. 138 times. I wrote it down on a piece of paper and found him and I said, Sir, I'd like to ask you something. Do you understand that word? We don't want to understand in That's many cases. Right. We hear only what we want to hear and our filter, our mental grid determines what we postpone, push aside, push away, push away. If it doesn't meet blessing us. So no wonder we're a pack of babies and the church has become a nursery. Let me give you a third test. How mature should you be or how much impact should you be exercising worldwide in light of how long you have been saved, how much truth you have been exposed to, and the clearly defined purpose of God for every Christian to impact the world? Ooh. Ooh. Now, let me give you the third thing quickly. The signs of spiritual immaturity. And I really don't know how much further I'll get. I'm not going to look at my watch. And like I've said before, if you look at yours, I hope you get leprosy. Let <laughs> me give you the signs of spiritual immaturity. Listen carefully. Now follow me. This will be a little easier to take. A little easier to hear anyway. Number one, babies can't feed themselves. Paul said to the Corinthians, and I could not speak to you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ, I have fed you with milk. Babies can't feed themselves. You know, you can take an infant child, put him in a high chair, put the tray across the place, stack that tray up with pablum, and that baby will starve to death unless somebody feeds him. Right. You know what else you can do? You can take that baby's head, and it's a little loose anyway, <laughs> and you can push him down in that pablum, and he'll still starve to death unless somebody feeds him. Pastor, you better listen carefully. I, I think I'm about to say the most important thing that a pastor can hear up to what I've heard this week, and I've said this week. Pastor, the key to your ministry is not what you feed your people. It's how well you teach them to feed themselves. Amen. 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 
Give a man a fish, you feed him for a day. Teach him to fish, he'll feed himself the rest of his life. Amen. Cut your own wood and it'll warm you twice. Yeah. Wrong. <laughs> In other words, don't come and be bottle fed by these great preachers. You get stuffed one minute and go a week with nothing. That's right. That's right. Amen. I have great confidence in your pastor. And I concur wholeheartedly with the acclamations that people have made about him. Amen. And I've watched him as carefully as I could here. I think he is a man of God. Amen. 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 And I'll tell you something else. Go ahead. Amen. I'll tell you something very carefully and you listen. I have not heard him preach and that's a crime. Amen. 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 Somewhere he ought to be given a talking place anyway. <laughs> Where he can preach. But you listen. I don't care how good a preacher he is. I haven't got enough confidence in his preaching to say I would be confident if your only feeding is what comes food fed to you from right. your pastor's yeah. spoon to your mouth right. week by week. That's not enough. You need to know how to feed yourself. Hey. And yeah. pastor, God pity you if you do not put the tools for self-study of your people in their hands where they can handle the Word of God at least as well, if not better than you do. Amen. Amen. Babies cannot feed themselves. Second one, babies can't walk. Prop a baby up. He'll totter there holding on to the chair. You'll get over here and say, Come to daddy. Come to daddy. And he'll smile real big. Take a step and boom! Down he goes. Well, you don't get mad at him. He can't walk. You pick him up, trying to teach him how to. You get him start. Come to daddy. And you hold your hands out a little closer this time so when he starts to fall, you might catch him. And you know he's going to have to fall a lot of times. See, babies can't walk. Let me ask you a question. How consistent are your steady steps for Jesus? I was pastor in Little Rock, Arkansas. Our church got under the throes of, a, of the, the working of God. One Sunday night, the altar was, was like it was last night right here. Crowded with people. And it began to happen regularly. We had people coming off the streets being saved that I never saw before in my life. And uh, right at the beginning of this, a beautiful little blonde-haired lady came down the aisle one, one, uh, that Sunday night. And she worked her way among all those people that are kneeling and praying and weeping and working with each other all around here. She came up to me and very, very soberly, she, she put her hand in mine. Beautiful lady, young woman. She said, Brother Herb, I want to know what's wrong with me. I said, what do you mean? She said, every time I come to hear you preach, I am absolutely determined I'm going to be the best Christian this community has ever seen. And then I walk out of this building, start down the steps, and fall flat on my face, and I find that I can't do it. What's wrong with me? Her name was Joe Scott. She would not at all mind, mind me telling you this story. I said, Joe, you've asked me. Let me be bluntly honest. You're carnal. Because babies can't consistently walk. I wish you could have seen her six months later. I hardly ever made a visit, but that she'd already been to the house. She joined one of our radical discipleship groups, a ladies group. I could hardly make a visit. She had already been there. You know what a lady told me one day? said, you've got the strangest church at all these other churches we visited. They came. They told us more about the church. said, that lady that came from your church only wanted to talk about Jesus. And that's not a boast about our church. God help us. It is a boast about her. Babies can't feed themselves. Babies can't walk. And listen real carefully. Babies can't talk. Hmm. I take a three-month-old, prop him up on his front seat down here, and I go down there and I say, Say, infantile <coughs> creature. <laughs> Have you ever given uh, consideration to this uh, possibility that some people are temperamentally precocious and extract quintessence from exercising a prodigious vocabulary for the edification of erudite pedagogues and infantile preachers such as present company? He <laughs> wouldn't even say that. He'd say, Whoa! But listen, I can 
วก็เป็นไส้หายดิจู
talking about what Christ-likeness is from a practical standpoint, only from a mystical standpoint, yeah. inner relationship, yeah. fruit of the Spirit, this kind of thing. But from a practical standpoint, the man who, whose line in the Bible originated that song, Philippians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul, spent his lone life traipsing all the way to the farthest reaches of the known civilized world of his day, letting blood about every third day, and it was his own. Somebody else treating him viciously and violently. And when he came down toward the end, he said, It is my desire that I may know him, the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death. And he was dragged almost everywhere he went by the Holy Spirit or somebody else saying, I die every day. Yeah. I want to know if we really mean it when we say, I want to be like Christ. <coughs> the most Christ-like thing you will ever do in this life is to build other human beings to the point of world impact. Yeah. Yeah. But I don't ever hear anybody talking about this. Why? Because tradition has interpreted for us and given us a track that we run on. And I gravely fear as important as that tradition is and as wonderful as what it says, it falls short of a practical definition of Christ's likeness. Did you know that when Charlie Chaplin, the famed comedian, was alive, they had a Charlie Chaplin look-alike contest over in Monaco. He boarded a ship and went over and anonymously entered that contest and came in third. <laughs> if Jesus were to enter a look-alike, a Christ-like look-alike contest in today's church, he'd come in somewhere besides first. That's right. And we would be horrified, indeed we will be in some likelihood when it's all over, to see how we missed it. Jesus could say of us, as well as all those church attenders who are in church more often than we are handling the Bible every day more seriously than we do, the Pharisees, and when it was over, or He looked them in the face early, and He said, your traditions absolutely negate the power of God. Yeah. Um, I'm going to borrow a crazy verse and tell you a crazy story. I copied this down out of my Amplified Bible, and so I do have something of a suggestive precedent for this, and if you, in fact, if this weren't on tape and you quoted me, I'd call you a liar, but I can't get rid of it if it's going to be on tape. It's like the last judgment. It comes back to face you every time you turn around. 2 Corinthians 11, 1. Don't turn to it. Just listen. This is the Amplified Bible. Paul said, I wish you would bear with me while I indulge in a little foolishness. <laughs> Indeed, do bear with me. He said. <laughs> this mother was trying to teach her little boy, tiny little boy, manners. I'm going to quote what the mother said. She said, son, when we're among people not in the home, we don't want to use words that might be misunderstood. We don't want to say TT. -t. <laughs> said, if you need to use the bathroom, you say to me, I need to whisper. <laughs> and I'll understand. And I'll get you to the bathroom. Well, just a short time later, the Christmas holidays came, and they were visiting the little lad's grandparents. He was up in his granddaddy's lap, and nature called, collect. <laughs> and he suddenly went rigid, and he said, Grandpa, I need to whisper. And his granddaddy said, Son, get up here and whisper in my ear. <laughs> and he did. And when it was over, his granddaddy said, Son, I'm sure glad you didn't need to shout. <laughs> Verse for that too. The first man is of 
the earth earthy. <laughs> and that fits. But you know what? Wonderful is what's been happening here. All in the world we're doing is listening to the mildest whispers of God. In fact, that's all we're going to get in this age. Earthquake, no. Fire, no. Mighty sound of mighty rushing wind, no. But then came a still small voice. Yeah. And be sure with all the noise, the great swell of this music, absolutely heavenly, marvelous. It, it's just been marvelous. I mean, those are rafter, ringer, roof-raising songs. Marvelous, marvelous. Don't they aid you to worship? Amen. And then the great preaching, great preaching. Uh, just one after another, great messages. And I'll frankly tell you, we've got a real stewardship problem on our hands now. We're house managers to be economizers of what we've heard. And the problem is we no sooner hear one than we hear a next one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you can't catch up with the one before you're on the way to the next one unless you deliberately take away to retain that first one You'll answer for something you will have long since forgotten when you stand before God. In fact, you forget it in the next message. Be careful. Be careful. I've got as careful notes as I know how to, and I'm going to get most of these tapes, and I want to listen to them again and again, and I'll hear things I didn't hear the first time, I'm yeah. sure, but be careful. Be careful. Be careful. Jesus talked more about hearing than anything else He ever talked about. That you hear, how you hear, what you hear. And he talked about it over and over again. Be careful, be careful, be careful. Any one of these men has drowned us in great truths of which we are stewards, managers, economists before God. God help us to understand. Brother Paul made a statement in his message this morning that was a catalyst in my mind. He said, and I'll just quote him roughly, but it's essentially accurate. He said, as I move all over this country and go into churches, I am very grieved everywhere I go over the shallowness of the people of God. I had the privilege of sitting at lunch with Major Ian Thomas some years ago, and at the end of the, well, we were together about two and a half hours in just personal conversation. And at the end of the time, I said, Major, tell me what you feel about Southern Baptists. And he smiled rather wryly and plied me with a question, which I don't need to tell you, and I answered him just as wryly. And he said, then I must tell you in a word, shallow. Shallow. I want you to turn in your Bible tonight to the book of Hebrews. <coughs> chapter 5. The book of Hebrews chapter 5. And I hardly know how to handle this text. It's so massive. We're just going to traffic the truth of it a few minutes. I'm going to teach. Actually, I'm the guy, I'm the light hitter who lays down the sacrificial bunt, the sacrifice bunt to get the base runners in scoring position for the slugger who's coming up. And I really mean that earnestly. That's true. I've heard this testimony. I know this man. I know Dixon Ryle. Boy, hey, when, I, when I thought about that, when you and I were talking the other day, that is absolutely incredible what has happened as a result of the things that were set in motion there. You're going to hear it tonight. And I don't want to get in the way in any way. I would actually defer this time and let Brother Walter have it happily. It's that good and that important. Amen. But I'm the butter to get the, the runners in scoring position. So let's lay down the sacrificial, the sacrifice bunt, and move the runners up to second and third. Get out of the way. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I'm a good butter. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 5, verse 11. Now, you'll notice we're breaking into a reading. It doesn't start here. You can tell that by of whom we have many things to say. Well, the whom there is Melchizedek. Now, if you want to know an example of meat as it's referred to here, it's the high priesthood after the order of Melchizedek. If you know what that means and can handle it, then you're pretty good at at least tackling meat. 
If you don't know what that means, God help you. You either lost or a baby. You see, living things are expected to grow. Amen. But dead things can't. Now, if you are not growing, you had better start with the first possibility that you're not alive. You have never been born of the Spirit of God. And thus, you cannot grow. You can't even be expected to be. You need to start at square one. You need to beg God for mercy and let Jesus save you upon the cue of the Holy Spirit who work freely in a place like this toward you. So we're talking about something very important. Verse 11 says, Of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered. In other words, we can't say these many things to you. And here's the reason. Seeing you are... Now let me tell you what the tense of that verb actually is. It literally says, Seeing you have become... Ah, so it's an acquired deficiency. It's not something that's natural for their stage where they should be. They have deteriorated into this. How? Probably by being pew potatoes. Listening to truth all the time. Without ever appreciating, appropriating, and applying. He says, seeing you have become dull, and that word has major emphasis. It's the same word that across the chapter division in chapter 6, verse 12, is translated slothful. It means lazy or, or, or sluggish of hearing. Let me read it again. We have many things to say to you about Melchizedek, and hard to say them for this reason, because you have become sluggish of hearing. <coughs> For when for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need instead that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, or the beginning ideas of the outspeakings of God. And you have become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness. For he is a baby. And that word babe or baby is major emphasis. It's God's sense of horror. It's the Holy Spirit's shout at you. Yeah, this is something you should never be. But look at you. For he is a baby. Oh, beg your pardon. Did I say never? Did you catch my error? Certainly you ought to be a baby. You can't be born without becoming something. You become a baby. I said never. No, you ought never at this stage to be a baby. That's what he's saying here. For he is a baby. But strong meat belongs to them that are of full age. Major emphasis. Full age. Now that's what God's after. So if you don't mind marking in your Bible, draw a circle around the two words full age. That's what he wants out of every one of his children. Strong meat belongs to them that are of 